Hi folks! Guess what we found recently? A whole bunch of skeletons from a now extinct line of creatures. Using the magic of Spore, I've decided to bring these various creatures to life. Ready? This is a Bladicus Nadian. A Bladicus Nadian is the common ancestor for all the creatures you are about to see. It is a no-eyed, two-legged, small creature with a, uh, I don't know what kind of mouth to call that, um, but basically I'm going to use this to explain exactly how evolution works. And this little kid cute. Okay, so a Bloticus netting, and indeed any form of life, if, will make changes. Oh my. In other words, if a thing is born, it's going to be born different from its mother and father. Those differences may sometimes be rather profound, um, you know, maybe a bigger beak than most. And eventually, these changes will be passed on, and those who are better suited for the environment will move on. Now, what I'm about to show you is what creationists call microevolution. But any scientists know that there is no difference between microevolution and macroevolution, and that the only real distinction is variation between species and variation within a species. In plain easier terms, anything that becomes a different species is macroevolution. This is Aplodocus mandata. Aplodocus mandata is the evolved form of Aplodocus nedium. Mandara has developed puny arm type things as well as primitive eyes. There's probably a transitional form, or five, between Nadian and Mandara, but we do know that this is what we see. Aren't they adorable? See, the Oblodicus needed to defend itself against incoming predators. So it developed eyes to see where they were coming from, and arms so that it could uh, fight them off and stuff. Yes. The development of arms is basically advantageous in any situation. Here we see the Oblodicus veracitus. The Oblodicus veracitus is a creature who's a descendant of the Oblodicus mandata, and it has developed a lengthened spine and its feet have developed a little bit. It's also developed something of a tail stub thingy. And its eyes have also creased in development just a little bit. Um, it's also changed its colors to blend in with its new purple tree environment, which you can't see here because there is no purple tree environment in the Spore Creature Creator. Shut up. And, uh, yeah, oh god, it's yelling at me now. <laughs> um, yeah. This is Oblodicus Nadian, and that's its kid. Er, this is Oblodicus Thoracitus, and this is only one of the several lines. We're following down this line, and then I'll show you another cool line leading to another place, and so on and so on and so forth until you've seen all of evolution. This is the Oblodicus Amicus. It's a continued evolutionary form of the Veracitan, that has changed its colors once again to fit in with its environment and has continued development of the feet and eyes. Its spine is also becoming a lot more straightened and a lot more upright, even though it's still not fully uh, straight yet. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, that's the Oblodicus amicus for you. See, here's, here's Oblodicus erectus. It has a fully straightened out spine and is perfectly capable of using its now overdeveloped hands and feet. It also has a weird spiky gem on its back, but that's not important. What I don't get about the creationist argument is how they claim microevolution and macroevolution are two different things. If they agree that natural selection can force changes in something, but only with a, in a kind, how come those changes can't just keep changing and changing and changing until later on, millions of generations later, we see entirely different animals that are merely descendants of the animals that came before. I mean, all evolution says is that everything is a modified version of whatever came before it. Cats don't give birth to dogs in evolution, that's not what it says at all. All it says is that humans are apes, are mammals, are reptiles, are amphibians, are fish. Which are single-celled 
eukaryotic organisms. That's all evolution says. And that's basically true. There's gotta be a mechanism if they're gonna argue that, but they can't. Anyway, this here is the new, uh, well, I don't want to say genus, because it looks like we've gone through a couple of genuses, but this is Erectus sapien, and if you don't know where I got the name from, you're absolutely insane. Um, Erectus sapien has grown a long tail, it's grown hair on its head, and it's developed its eyes lower down so that it can hunt better and has better uh, binocular vision. And as you can clearly tell, it's quite the acrobat. Going down another evolutionary line, we have Ablodicus natans. Again, if you don't catch the reference, you're insane. Ablodicus natans has, instead of a raised spine, has actually developed a swung low spine, with, and also has developed arms as well as a tail. Uh, Ablodicus natans is a descendant of Ablodicus mandata, and he's absolutely freaking adorable, as is his little child. Yay! Here's Ablodicus Zumerian. The Zumerian has a very interesting name and has started to grow spikes upon its back, which will later evolve in the other forms, but not in the lineage we're going to follow. This is an example of how evolution spreads from one animal to another. After Ablodicus Zumerian, we have Ablodicus Xenophilus. Uh, again, if you didn't catch the joke there, then you're not paying attention. Ablodicus xenophilus has developed wings and has become a carnivore as well as having a development of hands. Beware, beware! <laughs> this is Xenophilus waticus. It has evolved its wings to be much larger, it has evolved a spike on its tail for defense against the predators, and it has developed claws for grabbing its prey out of the ground. Yes, this is an animal that is both hunted and a hunter, uh, like some various species of animals, especially primates. Anyway, this, uh, primates and rats, for example. Anyway, Xenophilus wetticus is a perfect example of, again, macroevolution. What I've just shown you is, in brief, and a very, 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 very simplified version of how evolution works. Creationists themselves admit a that natural selection can cause small changes in a genome. That said, why can't a whole bunch of small changes amounted together become very, very big changes? Is it because they only believe the Earth is 6,000 years old and they think that there couldn't have possibly been time for that? Or is there some genetic reason for it? Indeed, if it is some proof of, if the designer made it that way, as they will so adamantly claim, then what proof is there that I made it that way? What genetic ortholog or what genetic process stops a dog from, after millions of years, not being recognized entirely as a dog? No, dogs do not give birth to cats, but given enough time, dogs will give birth to things that are better suited for their environment than they currently are if the environment changes long enough. In other words, you take it, you walk an inch, you can walk a mile. And that's exactly what evolution says. It says you need a lot of time to do it, but it says it can be done. And it takes a while for mammals, but we've seen drastic evolutionary changes and bugs. That's, and that's all creationists need to know.